Welcome to Teletour. My name is Igor. I'm a tour guide for a Normandy tour and I will present you today the town of Saint-Malo. Saint-Malo is located an hour away north from Rennes and one hour from Mont Saint-Michel. The town of Saint-Malo grew over the centuries from the discovery of the Americas in 1492 and really until 1815 and the capture of Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. The town of Saint-Malo could be compared with today Macau, Hong Kong or even Singapore because of the importance back then of trade, trade of slaves, spices, wines, furs and all goods coming from America, Africa and Asia. The town of Saint-Malo is very tight, tightly connected with privateers and pirates. The privateers are basically pirates or former members of the navy, of the French navy, which back then, from the 16th century, decided to enter privateering, which is the way to race and attack all enemy ships from Netherlands, Spain and England, which were also trying to control the roads of trade with Africa, America and Asia. So these guys, these privateers, uh, on their own ships had the right to attack and ransom all ships from other nations and keep 30% of the capture. 70% was supposed, I say supposed, to be given to the King of France. But that was not always the case and as you may know, former pirates could keep a secret place where they would keep everything. Still, Saint-Malo became more and more wealthy with traders and privateers also making a fortune from that race, la course in French. And the town of Saint-Malo, located just north of the Rance, also allowed traders to send the goods from Saint-Malo south of Brittany and, and, and then on the other part of France in the Loire Valley. It's also very important to understand. The people of Saint-Malo enjoyed relative freedom and, uh, and uh, economic freedom especially because the kings of France, from Francis I, the first one to really develop the town, decided to set very little taxes, even at one point there were zero taxes in, in Saint-Malo, in order to uh, boom, boost the economy of Brittany, France and of the, and, uh, and of the French Empire at seas. So the town of Saint-Malo has very large uh, walls uh, to protect the town from potential attacks from England, Spain or Netherlands. These walls were designed a second time by Vauban, the Minister of Interior and Defense of Louis XIV. And here you can see also the symbol of Saint-Malo. On the right side, all the parishes of Brittany. And on the left side, the symbol of the town of Saint-Malo, a gate because the town was closed that night, and the dog with a fleece and a dog walking over the gate. These dogs were set from the time of Louis XIV and until the French Revolution in order to calm down the town because in, in a town where there were so many pirates and privateers it became a little bit rowdy and rough at, at some point and the French church did not like what was going on here the kind of life people were living. So it was decided by the King Louis XIV, the builder of Versailles to set the curfew at 9 p.m. and until 7 a.m. and to release big dogs at night. The dogs were then killed only in 1793 by the French revolutionaries, angry at this uh, old uh, tradition, and uh, it stopped. And, but uh, a couple of years later, Napoleon Bonaparte was captured at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. But still, it is the symbol of Saint-Malo. Saint-Malo was sadly completely bombed during the Second World War, complete, 90% of the town was destroyed and it was rebuilt and the reconstruction of Saint-Malo entered by the late 70s only. The town of Saint-Malo owes its wealth and reputation to trade, all kinds of trades. So the streets don't bear the names of important marshals, generals of France, but only of the kind of goods you could find in one street or also the names of saints. Brittany and Saint-Malo are very pious, very Catholic, so that's why you have saints or trades. Saint-Malo was at one point so prosperous that it had a couple of open-air markets. There was a market for fish, one for f meat, one for vegetables, and one for furs also, and, and leather goods. Voilà. Saint-Malo is a very touristy town, you can see with many cafes, many uh, outdoor life. Now it's September, it is still very warm, the season is still great. 
And I'm standing now just in front of the town hall of Saint-Malo, where you can see the French flag here at the bottom. This same French flag has a funny history. The General de Gaulle, when he arrived in Saint-Malo after the end of the Second World War in July 45, wanted to come to Saint-Malo because he had heard that over 170 resistance fighters had been killed in front of Saint-Malo and he wanted to pay respect to them. He came by train from Paris and when he got out of the train, he did not see any French flag uh, flying over the town. He just saw the flag of Saint-Malo, the one you can see over there. He could see the flag of Saint-Malo and the flag of Brittany, but nothing French. So he asked the mayor to put down the flag of Saint-Malo and to raise the banner of France. The mayor of Saint-Malo told him, yes, yes, my general. When he got out, there was still the, French, the flag of Saint-Malo up and not the French flag. The flag of Saint-Malo and the identity of Saint-Malo is the sea. Uh, most kids go sailing on Wednesday and in the weekend. Everyone is connected with the sea uh, and uh, the cross because most people are cr Christian Catholic. And you have also the dog, the dog I told you about during the curfew. Voilà. And this uh, tower just here was a tower which was used to keep powder and guns in order to protect the town from attacks coming from Netherlands, England or even Spain. Because the privateers from Saint-Malo and from Normandy and Brittany were really uh, lowering the importance of trade uh, for England and Netherlands because this spot of uh, Normandy and Brittany is really in front of England so that was the last part of the trip for a ship coming from the Caribbean, Africa or America uh, so the ship was usually exhausted and attacked at the last moment by very small and fast ships from Saint-Malo. So this uh, huge tower has openings and not to shoot at the town but th these openings were made to keep the powder dry that's all and the cannons the openings for the cannons were on the other side here is the portrait of uh, Chateaubriand François René de Chateaubriand the founder of the romantic movement he was a native from Brittany but he is buried in um, Saint-Malo facing the sea as he wanted his tomb is standing in front of the sea the romantic movement is a movement which started after the French Revolution. In a way, it's nostalgia of the old days of the knights, of the castles, and also the focus on strong feelings, loneliness, and wild nature. Chateaubriand also gave its name to the famous stake many of you know in the US. Now you can see these walls, another part of the wall. The walls are all around the town, so when you are in Saint-Malo, someone feels very, very safe. The walls are uh, 10 meters high and 4 to 5 meters large. Back then, uh, when privateer was still going on, there were even kennels within the walls, dogs, and small uh, houses like this one just in front of me. I'll show you now that it was really impossible to get close to Saint-Malo for anyone who wanted to take the town, because you have these gates, but way before the gates, there was one way to get close to the port, just one way, and this way was crossing through um, forts which had very big cannons. You can see here the Fort National, the Fort National, in front of it, Fort Harbour, then Césambre, and all of these islands had cannons pointing the same direction, and to get to the port, there was just one way, it was through these islands. So yeah, absolutely impossible. And everywhere else, if you ever wanted to go somewhere else to take Saint-Malo, uh, there are high reefs, high reefs all along this part of Brittany. So extremely dangerous to get close to the coast. And no one in France was allowed to print anything about the reefs of Brittany. That was absolutely secret. And it was something known from father to son, from fisherman to fisherman. That's it. Voilà. So this is where the French resistance fighters were killed in July 45 just inside this fort, the Fort National. Voilà. You can still visit the fort and see how uh, soldiers were living in the 17th century. I'll go back inside the town of Saint-Malo and show you a few things about the pirates and privateers. So, as you have understood, a privateer is a pirate or a former uh, member of the, uh, the French Navy with the right to attack and capture everything from a ship from England, Netherlands or Spain. And uh, at one point, one of them became so important, Robert de Surcouf, because of his links with Napoleon, that he became the mayor of the town. 
actually even before, a century before, uh, René de Guetrouin, the real architect of the town, was a privateer also. He left the navy because he wanted to make more money, so he entered privateering. Privateers paid much more. It was very risky, but the, um, the financial gain was huge compared to being in the navy. Robert Surcouf, the mayor of Saint-Malo at the time of Napoleon, around 18 uh, to 1815, was from a wealthy family from Saint-Malo, but he didn't want to go in the footsteps of his father, so he joined the privateers in order to make much more money. Here you can see a section where is the first original wall of Saint-Malo, just there. And this section here was added by Vauban by the 17th century, creating a moat in between two walls. You can see that the first original wall was never rebuilt, uh, we don't have any danger with England today, it's okay, we don't risk anything. So that was just to create a ditch after the first wall. Voilà. So you can clearly see on this building that it was originally a wall. On the bottom of the building you can see that the, that was the original wall. This is the same stone used for the Mont Saint-Michel, granite also. Everything is made out from granite in Saint-Malo. Back then, there were buildings made with half timber, with much more wood than today. The curfew also was said to be set from the time of Louis XIV to Napoleon in order to avoid the fires, because back then uh, all the houses were made out of wood, so it was uh, very dangerous to have fires at night, and uh, people working at night or the bars open at night only had fireplaces, candles everywhere, so that was also to avoid fires. A town like this one with so many tall buildings could disappear in a night. So that was also to preserve the town from that. Now you have a very nice point of view on the bay in Saint-Malo. Here just in front of me stands the Grand Bay where is buried François-René Chateaubriand and the island of Cézambre. The island of Cézambre in front of me, there, the large one, is the, was the last one, the last location of Brittany where the Germans were still standing and napalm gas was used there in August 44 to get rid of the Germans because Germans were still there uh, shooting at Saint-Malo where Americans were already, so it's, the Americans did not have yet Saint-Malo because Germans were there. To get rid of, Germ of a German division there, napalm was dropped. Voilà. Now at low tide, you can see that there is a very nice beach in Saint-Malo. And when high tide comes, in about three hours, the beach will disappear completely. It will be only water. Voilà. The third tower you see in front of me here was also used to keep powder for the cannons. And there is a funny story about this uh, tower. It's called the Tower of the Little Machine. The Little Machine was a ship designed by England in the, in the 18th century in order to try to destroy Saint-Malo. The huge ship was filled with cannons, powder, guns, set to go straight to Saint-Malo when the wind was good, back, a strong back wind. At the last moment the crew would leave, set the sail straight. Unfortunately, just five minutes before it got close to Saint-Malo, the wind stopped, the ship froze, did not move, exploded, because all the, uh, the powder was ready to explode, exploded far away. So most of the windows of the town exploded, but no one got killed except for a small cat. And uh, the, the cat without its head was then taken and sent to England as a gift, uh, sent to the King of England telling him, okay, try again, you did not kill anyone, maybe another time. And the uh, house, you can see the older house in front of you is actually the house of the dancing cat because this cat was found without its head. And the funny thing is that the same house was the house of the parents of Robert Surcouf. Robert Surcouf, which stands in front of you, you can see a statue of a man pointing as if he was telling, let's go attack this ship. So this is the statue of Surcouf. And here, just in front of you now, the house where his parents lived and I'll show you that the street is called the Street of the Dancing Cat, Rue du Chat qui Danse, because that was just here that the cat was found without its head.
Voilà, rue du Chat danse. Voilà, this is the original house of the father of Surcouf. So, a guy who was supposed to run his father's company, selling ropes and all kinds of goods for a shipping industry um, in the late 18th century. But Surcouf was ambitious. He wanted to make more money. He wanted to sail the world. So he left, became a pirate, then joined the privateers, and would go on to be the wealthiest man in France. Because when Napoleon came to visit his house, close to this one, Napoleon was quite angry because he, well, he liked Surcouf, but he looked down and he saw that he was walking on gold. Nothing wrong about that, except that he was walking on golden Napoleon. The, the coins, the golden coins, were called Napoleon, and they had the face up. So Napoleon was walking on his face. So he told Surcouf, okay, I like you very much. You did great things to destroy the terrible English Navy, but please move away these coins. I don't want to walk on my face. Napoleon would come one, a year later, and he was happy. He saw that Surcouf had moved the, the coins on the trench this way. So Napoleon said, okay, this way, no problem. Voilà. So I hope you enjoyed the tour of Saint-Malo, and I hope to see you on another tour. So let's tell the tour. Bye-bye.